Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's broadcast, Preventive Strategies in Emerging Mental Disorders in Young People, Clinical Staging and Translational Research. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. We have a few important announcements before we begin. Due to scheduling and travel conflicts of the speaker, Dr. Patrick McGorry, we have pre-recorded his presentation. For this reason, we will not host a live Q&A following Dr. McGorry's presentation. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Patrick McGorry. Dr. McGorry is the Executive Director of Origin, Professor of Youth Mental Health at the University of Melbourne, and a Director of the Board of the National Youth Mental Health Foundation. He is a world-leading researcher in the area of early psychosis and youth mental health, and has a strong interest in promoting the mental health of the homeless, refugees, and asylum seekers. Dr. McGorry's work has played a critical role in the development of safe, effective treatments and innovative research into the needs of young people with emerging mental disorders, notably psychotic and severe mood disorders. He has also played a major part in the transformational reform of mental health services to better serve the needs of vulnerable young people. Dr. McGorry has published extensively in the specialist literature and serves as Editor-in-Chief of Early Intervention in Psychiatry. He is a Fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia and is the current President of the Society for Mental Health Research and the President-Elect of the Schizophrenia International Research Society. Please refer to Dr. McGorry's image in the top left corner of your screen for more information about him. I will now turn it over to Dr. McGorry for his presentation. Okay, um, well welcome everybody. Um, my name is Patrick Mazzari. I'm a Professor of Youth Mental Health at the University of Melbourne and the uh, Executive Director of Origin, the National Centre of Excellence in Youth Mental Health. And today I'm going to be talking about how we can, with existing knowledge, transform mental health care and mental health outcomes, particularly for young people with emerging mental disorders, using some, treat some, some key concepts, um, clinical staging, a very simple idea of early, early intervention and a focus on young people because 75% of um, major mental disorders emerge before the age of 25. <clears throat> now mental health, it's been the poor cousin in, in so many ways in mental health care and mental health research and medical research, but we think it's an awakening giant and this is a cartoon from uh, a uh, major newspaper in Melbourne uh, from a year or so ago um, in the context of an election campaign. And in healthcare, mental health 
has to be the awakening giant, and I'll explain why. This is a worldwide phenomenon that has great interest in global mental health, and especially in developing countries where it's a very even more neglected issue than it is in the rich countries, which is saying something. Um, and the economists are becoming our new best friends because the World Economic Forum, among many other uh, publications, um, including many uh, interesting articles in the Economist magazine, the World Economic Forum showed with four sets of economic analyses in 2011 that mental illness is a biggest threat to economic output, the GDP, over the next 20 years in, in, in developed and developing countries. It's twice as important economically as cancer, where vast sums of money are poured into the treatment and research on. And it's on the par and probably a little bit more important than cardiovascular disease. So of the non-communicable diseases, mental illness is the major issue, um, and it's been neglected compared to the other, these other areas. The public know this. Um, in Australia, um, going back a couple of years now, but um, when surveys are done, mental illness and mental health are major issues in the public mind now, which was not the case going back some years. So public, through self-interest, um, and I suppose a greater awareness and understanding of at least some mental illnesses, particularly depression and anxiety, um, they realise that um, it's their necks on the line here uh, if we don't actually do a better job. And um, we need to give the public a much stronger voice here. And once the public get a voice, then the politicians will actually soon fall into line. Our public broadcaster, um, the, the major uh, broadcaster in Australia, the ABC, Australian Broadcasting Commission, basically uh, devotes a whole week of programming to, um, to mental illness each year now, the uh, last two years at least, and it's radio, TV, internet, everything. Um, you cannot avoid mental illness during that week in October um, in, in Australia. So these are all positive developments. So it leads us to tackle some key issues which we're in the field of psychiatry and mental health we're struggling with. Um, how do we actually develop a diagnostic approach that's going to be useful. Um, now obviously, validity is an important issue here, but and we, we've tried to tackle reliability with DSM and other approaches, and that's, that's solved that problem up to a point. But, but um, we haven't really worked out how to value diagnosis and, and, and allow to add value. That's the whole point of um, labeling people in this way. I mean, labeling's got a bad name, but there is a, if there's a purpose and a utility to it, it's, it's a worthwhile thing to do. Um, it's stimulated a lot of controversy and criticism, including from people that actually contributed to the problem, like, like Dr. Francis here. He acknowledges this in his role as chair of DSM-4, widening the diagnostic boundaries as he sees it. Um, and now he's in a, in a, um, a rearguard action to, to wind back the boundaries of, of mental health. But the problem here is that this is going to be very difficult to develop early intervention if, if, this, is, if, this, if this constant anxiety is there about what's normal and what isn't normal. And the reason the anxiety is there is because of the crude and poor quality treatment that people often are provided with um, by an under-resourced under and poor low morale mental health system. Um, I think if we had a stepwise and um, carefully balanced and proportional treatment response with safety as the priority and, and risk-benefit analysis as the key issue, then there wouldn't be a problem with intervening early in people who are on the, the border of just normal life troubles and, um, and emerging mental disorder, which is it's very difficult to tell the difference between these two things, of course, at the end of early stages. So I think... There are a lot of simplistic arguments going on here which feed into people's prejudices and their anxieties and the traditional anti-psychiatrist sort of, uh, sense. But if we look at it in a bit more detail, um, normal people actually aren't excluded from the health system. That's the example of being pregnant women and, and, and especially high-risk pregnancy. Other examples are people who don't actually have an illness but have got risk factors for them. Um, so people are allowed to see the doctor, um, and have preventive 
health care for cardiovascular disease, um, cancer risk, diabetes, etc. Um, it, in fact, it's valued. It's not, it's not um, warned against. It's actually valued. So this is a real disconnect between the way we approach psychiatry, where we're warning people to avoid care because you might be normal, and, and, and the opposite stance that's taken in, in um, general health care. I could go on about this, but we're a bit short of time. But why is this? Why is this double standard? Why this difference um, um, between mental illness and physical illness? Well, as I alluded to already, we have come for a long way back in psychiatry and there's been you know, um, poor treatment, harmful treatment, and um, particularly in the US, I would say, over-treatment, uh, because treatment in the US is, is, is equated with drug therapy. Psychological and social forms of treatment are not respected or funded to the extent they should be. And so, you know, there's a natural anxiety that if, if a diagnosis or a, um, acceptance of the need for care is made, that, that that will mean drug therapy, whereas everyone knows that not everyone with poor mental health needs drug therapy. Um, and uh, a stepwise approach based on risk and uh, safety is, is obviously the way to go. But then, obviously, stigma, labelling, um, discrimination, these issues come into it. Another issue is the soft bigotry of low expectations, where people are not really expected to to fully recover. And so, you know, um, that is a bit of a disincentive to actually seeking help. We're not... We're not um, offering cure, we're not offering hope in sufficient quantities and we don't expect people, um, we don't respect them and their, their resilience and um, to benefit from comprehensive treatment. So that's something that's really got to change and we've seen this in schizophrenia um, that a much more optimistic approach to schizophrenia now linked to early intervention and more intensive treatment in the early stages of illness and we are seeing much better results where that's delivered properly. So I think the harmful cultures, the the kind of um, narrow forms of treatment, and the the trauma that people often experience when they encounter traditional psychiatric care has eroded trust and confidence and undermined this idea that we should be proactive and, and seek people to help people to seek help in the early stages of illness. Under treatment is a, is a massive problem, even in rich countries. This is a report from the OECD from 2014, um, where they say the current weak state of mental health care is unacceptable. And this is in the rich countries. Imagine what's happening in the developing world. So more must be done to make mental health count and improve the lives of those suffering from mental health. And it must be given the importance it, it demands by policymakers in terms of resources and policy prioritization. Now, these are motherhood statements and they're advocacy statements, but um, um, it's really a political issue for the public to, to uh, consider. Everywhere in the world we see neglect of the mentally ill, whether it's um, in the developed countries with homelessness uh, and mental illness, or in, in worse scenarios in developing countries. The general experience of patients is too little, too late, and it's very hard to access high quality care. Um, it is possible, but um, <clears throat> even where there are significant numbers of mental health professionals, quality cannot be assured because of the culture and systemic issues and also training issues. So it's not surprising that these polemics, um, but it is another one, The Book of Woe by um, Gary Greenberg. Um, um, basically throwing petrol on the fire of the DSM controversy. Obviously the DSM system um, hasn't worked as well as it, it was hoped and there are reasons for this but um, it, it's, um, it's kind of a catalyst for all the ambivalence that, that is felt towards um, mental illness in general and in the, in the types of psychiatric care that are available currently. So a new way of thinking about diagnosis is necessary, um, and Jim Van Oss and I tried to outline some of the issues in the editorial and the Lancet um, in 2013. Um, diagnosis, what is it for? Uh, what's the purpose of it? Um, and we came down 
on the side of utility. Diagnosis is meant to be for treatment selection. Some people think it's, it's important as a, as a prognostic um, guide, which I would say is a secondary purpose of diagnosis. The main purpose is to, to distinguish the treatment of patient A from patient B. If the diagnosis cannot do that, then there's no point in making it. Diagnostic reform has been underway in the US through the research domain criteria, which is really for research diagnoses uh, to try to progress um, understanding of uh, in discovery terms. But it's not going to be much use to clinicians in this dimensional sort of approach that's being developed here, at least not in the short, short term, although it makes a lot of sense in, in most other ways. Uh, an approach which we've been developing for the last 10 years in, in Australia and um, exporting and, and collaborating with other, other people in other parts of the world is clinical staging. Now, this has many of the features of the RDARC approach in the sense that it's um, trying to be transdiagnostic in terms of the traditional categories, but um, it's also got some categorical structure to it so that um, there are different stages of illness as well as different syndromal pathways and patterns. Uh, and um, categories are important for clinicians because um, the categories, um, a yes or no decision about whether it's stage one or two, let's say, might very much influence the type of treatment that's selected and the safety and effectiveness of those treatments. And we've published, as I've said, uh, quite a number of papers since 2006 when we first started writing about this. Um, it, it's a heuristic idea. Just some more papers here. It's um, been adopted within different silos already by schizophrenia, by Tom Insel, and bipolar. It's also been used in biomarker research. And um, just, just think about staging now. Um, what it is is quite a simple thing. It developed originally in oncology and other areas of medicine, not just oncology, is a subtyping strategy to help select safe and effective treatments and predict outcome as well. It's a more refined method of diagnosis. So knowing that someone has breast cancer is insufficient to know how to go about treating them. The stage and, and even profiling the patient these days uh, are additional things that need to be done to refine the diagnosis. But staging certainly is intended to do that. It's obviously going to be useful in early intervention because it's, it's trying to identify the earlier stage of a need for care when there's risk of a serious illness present and early symptoms present or early signs. Um, but um, it also protects against over-treatment, as I alluded to before, which um, uh, is, is a genuine issue. Um, and um, so the risk-benefit uh, ratio is very important to consider uh, and it changes from stage to stage. So at stage three or four breast cancer, we'll receive um, more intensive treatment, which will have much more serious side effects potentially uh, in a desperate attempt to achieve you know, better, a better outcome. But um, the outcome isn't better overall compared to stage one and the treat treatment is certainly more risky. The other thing that staging can do is hopefully clarify the confusing array of biological research findings which have been found in psychiatry uh, across all the different syndromes. There's more continuity across syndromes than there is differentiation. And staging might help to actually clarify um, the significance of, of particular biomarkers as to whether they are uh, markers of disease, whether they're causal risk, risk, risk markers or risk factors what their significance actually is. Okay, so the problem is that some, of, some researchers have taken up the staging idea within their own uh, particular silo of research, whether it's schizophrenia or bipolar um, or, or another one, and try to develop it in, in parallel or isolation. But actually, staging is a transdiagnostic idea, and we do think that the early stages of illness at least at that point, you know, perhaps around the early stage one, perhaps, um, the patients are quite truly potential, and there would be a, a range of, of morbid outcomes from these um, early stage or sub conditions. Um, and, and 
perhaps mixtures of comorbidity over time as well, which makes it even more complex. So it's a more fluid situation. And I think that another idea that um, Jim Van Oss has written about is the idea that symptoms might, might actually influence each other and might actually um, increase the risk of other symptoms developing. So um, it's, it's kind of a very dynamic situation that you see in these young patients as they experience the early stages, the early reaches of, of, a, of a mental disorder. And of course, these problems can resolve and remit without progressing as well. So it's not a deterministic or an inexorable process like we, we often see in cancer, for example. It's a much more dynamic thing, perhaps more akin to um, respiratory diseases like asthma, for example, where uh, symptoms come and go, but the vulnerability might remain. Staging can be useful in clinical practice. Um, Shane Cross and colleagues in Sydney have shown that um, transition across any stage to the next stage results in a worsening of outcome, unless, of course, treatment changes. And if the treatment is changed by the clinician on the basis of a stage change, which is what's meant to happen, for example, if someone goes from sub-threshold psychosis to sustained full-threshold psychosis, then antipsychotics are, are started at that point, and, and the patient um, typically res responds very well. So that, that's a, a better outcome, actually, despite the, the, the increase in stage. Biomarkers, we've tried to, to look at the world literature on, on this across diagnostic groups, um, but um, it's difficult to find enough information in many respects because the early stages have not been researched um, sufficiently widely, uh, particularly when, um, beyond psychosis. Um, so there's a lot more work that can be done to actually fill out this picture, and this is why we use the term heuristic for, for staging. So, and this is this is um, this slide here is, is meant to just show that different biomarkers can be studied strongly uh, by stage, and um, they might relate more strongly to stage, in fact, than to particular syndrome. Although uh, it is a bit of a matrix, and these these uh, biomarkers obviously are linked to potential therapeutic mechanisms as well, which which will allow us to test them in intervention studies. Um, and again, staging is a very important um, framework for helping to design the right kind of intervention and follow-up studies. Here's just one example of a biomarker, which is cross-diagnostic. Um, hipp hippocampal volume loss uh, is seen in depression, PTSD, and schizophrenia. And we can see here that it, it, in, in the psychosis schizophrenia world, it's, um, <coughs> it's, it seems to be something that, that um, develops with worsening of, or progression of the illness into more chronic forms. So it's more like a, a marker of progression. Um, uh, and it's true significant, it's sort of probably not that well understood, but it's, it's, um, it's something that worsens with severity and persistence of illness, it seems. Okay, skip those two. So just moving on a bit more quickly now into early, early intervention in, in psychosis. Um, this, is, this, of course, has been the evidence-based prototype for early intervention more broadly in mental health, and the, 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 you know, we're trying to um, stimulate cross-diagnostic uh, approaches here, particularly through the journal Early Intervention in Psychiatry. And, of course, despite the, the imperative and the rhetoric about uh, seeking help early and uh, providing early intervention, um, often the reality is somewhat different, as, as uh, this slide sort of suggests. Yet, in 20 years, we've made a lot of progress. Um, um, the main frontier of this has been the prodromal or clinical high-risk or ultra-high-risk state. Um, the first stage of, of um, mental ill health uh, along the psychosis pathway at which a need for care is clearly present and also a risk for progression to more serious forms of psychosis is also present. And um, this was captured by operational criteria that Alice and you and I developed in the early 1990s in Melbourne. And um, they basically capture a sub-threshold psychotic state, um, also bringing in family history and other non-specific forms of, of, of change and deterioration as well. But essentially it's a sub-threshold 
uh, risk state for psychosis. Now, it also has a need for care in itself. It's not just asymptomatic uh, risk state, such as someone who turns up for a random blood sugar and is found to have no uh, blood sugar but has no symptoms. But is that risk of diabetes? This is quite different. These patients are actually distressed, health seeking, functionally impaired with global assessment functioning, GAF scores in, in, in the low 50s, and really quite struggling with, with, um, with the transition to adulthood, with their relationships, with identity formation, with um, academic performance or, or work performance. So they have a need for care, and that's really no doubt about that. Uh, this letter analysis from Paolo Fusilopoli shows. The risk for psychosis is about 36%. It, it might be less than that in more recent cohorts, but it's still at a very substantial risk of persistent psychotic illness. Um, now, you might say then that the majority of these patients are false positives because most of them do not develop a psychotic illness, even though that's the, the, the focus of the criteria trying to predict that. Well, that's true, but in fact, if we follow up the patients who do not transition, the vast majority of them, all, of, all apart from 7%, have some form of, of um, mental ill health or mental illness, particularly mood and anxiety, often complicated by personality and substance use issues. Now, these patients have very significant need for not just immediate mental health care, but mental health care over a, over a significant period of time, even if they don't transition to psychosis. Um, many of them who do not transition also have persistent or fluctuating subspecial psychotic symptoms which cause distress and, and, and impaired as well. So there's no question um, that these patients have a valid right to entry to, to mental health care. And the scaremongering that went on about that um, was, and led to the uh, exclusion of the, of the category from DSM is certainly not justified. It probably was a good idea not to put it in DSM-5 because there's a broader transdiagnostic uh, challenge here which might have been preempted by just focusing on psychosis. But the idea that there's somehow, or the misinformation about these patients being not ill or asymptomatic is clearly um, has been a, a disservice. We need to provide care for these patients. If you look at the rest of medicine, even asymptomatic patients with risk, as I mentioned before, like pre-diabetes, with a 5 to 10 percent only chance of transition to diabetes, are offered um, psychosocial lifestyle change and medication if they need it. If, if the abnormality is still there, so that's a different standard and no controversy there. And the same with statins, where a 7.5 percent risk of a major cardiovascular event is that in 10 years, not, not three years, but 10 years, there's sufficient grounds to prescribe a statin to these patients. Again, much less heat in, um, in, 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 this, in this debate uh, about that than what we've seen um, for patients who are at risk of persistent psychosis and already have a need for care. There have been a number of trials carried out um, in these super high-risk patients over the years. We've conducted about four of them ourselves, and other workers in other countries have conducted the rest. Um, overall, the meta analysis by Mark Vandekarg shows that um, there's a 50% risk reduction in the first 12 months to these treatments that have been offered in these trials. And the good news is that safer treatments like CBT and, or, and cognitive behavioral case management are effective in reducing this risk. Um, as are low dose antipsychotics and fish oil, but um, the safer treatments, uh, um, the fact that they, they work in terms of delaying at least the onset, um, uh, that's sufficient grounds for them to be offered first line or to basically say that antipsychotics should not be used as first line treatment. Now, that's difficult in, particularly in North America where um, reaching with a prescription pad happens much more quickly because of the the mindset and also the health financing systems there, which don't support psychosocial care, but it's quite clear that medication should not be used as first line with patients, and they should be provided with support, CBT, and needs-based treatment for any other issues they're presenting with. 
we've been trying to re replicate the very uh, exciting findings of the omega-3 fatty acid study that was led in Vienna by Paul Aminger, uh, with both short-term and long-term benefits for patients. Um, but now we've been in the process of reporting the, these results. They don't look as encouraging as the first study, and uh, it may just prove to be a, a subgroup that respond in this way to omega-3 if indeed um, there is a response. So to summarize the clinical high risk area, we can identify clinical phenotypes with a need for care, which has a substantial risk of transition to psychosis, probably somewhere between the 20 and 40 percent range. We can reduce this risk through the provision of relatively specialized psychosocial care, influenced by CBT. There are other comorbid or emerging instant syndromes which means that there is a valence for other exit syndromes, not just psychosis, and a range of outcomes, including persistence or recurrence of the subthreshold psychotic symptoms, um, uh, can occur and you know, commonly occur. We need to clarify the sequence of optimal treatment for the ultra-high risk stage, and that's the study in the focus of our new study we're about to start. Um, and ideally, this needs to be done in parallel with the prediction and treatment of other syndromes so that we don't continue to uh, research patients within these uh, restrictive categories um, which are over a century old and actually don't work that well at the early stages of illness. So the new trial funded by NIH um, is to clarify the sequence of treatments, starting with very simple psychosocial interventions, testing more intensive ones against that, and then adding in uh, FSRIs on a random basis later on, because there's some evidence that FSRIs are prevented in terms of transition to psychosis and perhaps neuroprotective. Um, and many patients, of course, do have depression, but this is not why they're being tested in this trial. There would be other options that could be tested here, such as anti-inflammatory options, but that's not part of the current study. Omega-3 and uh, low-dose antipsychotics are offered as a choice after many months if the patients have actually not made a response um, to the series of safety interventions. Now, beyond the program or the ultra high risk safe, and the next point is the first episode of psychosis. And we developed a program in Australia called EPIC back in 1992, which had a comprehensive early detection strategy with a youth access team our program clinic was linked to that, the PACE clinic. We had inpatient care. We had a whole range of psychosocial uh, and case management options for patients over the first two years of illness, including um, a number of research orientated uh, psychosocial interventions such as uh, CBT, suicide prevention, and adaptation. Later, vocational interventions uh, are based on the RPS model or Amazon too. So, very comprehensive and um, in our experience and also in RCTs conducted in Europe, this type of model definitely improves the, the, the early outcome for patients within the first two years, and it saves money as well. Uh, this became a worldwide phenomenon during the 1990s and 2000s with the International Early Psychosis Association um, bringing people together around this focus. Um, the membership has grown dramatically over the last two decades. The 10th international meeting of this organization will be held in Milan in um, uh, October this year. And it's broadening the focus in this conference to mood disorders and other mental disorders uh, for early, early intervention. So I think psychosis has been the template, the, the prototype, but now we're, we're welcoming in researchers from other domains to apply these ideas uh, across the board. And that's a very exciting development. These early psychosis programs do work. Here's a systematic review by Loretta Nordentoff, published in Current Opinion um, a year or two ago. Um, even more dilute forms of it, which just involve us and sort of into treatment, um, seem to work, um, according to this analysis. And more intensive forms are likely to work even better, especially if they're used for a longer period of time. Two years is probably too short. Many, many patients need at least five years to achieve the sustained recoveries. It's cost effective. Um, the majority of patients are in the bottom 
quads is here cheaper and better, so it reduces hospitalizations and it reduces the amount of outpatient care that's needed to uh, for some time as well. So um, outcomes better, cost less money. Why aren't all governments doing this? Well, many, many more are. In the US, as a result of the GRAVE study um, published last year, uh, we've seen um, 29 states, we understand, starting to invest more strongly in early intervention programs. The UK was probably the, the main leader in this during the 2000s with massive increase in early intervention teams across the whole of England. And I mentioned RAISE, well this is, it took a while to happen, but um, RCT was conducted in the US, um, funded by NIH, and, and it showed positive outcomes for the more specialised form of care uh, for the first episode patients. Um, and uh, both in terms of symptoms and functioning. And it was particularly the case, let's, let's see if I can find the right slide here, oh yes. Um, if, if, if patients had a, a shorter DUP, and um, this is kind of liberally, liberally defined here, because um, 34 weeks was, uh, was the division point, um, patients tended to have a, a better response to these more intensive models. In our data, um, this change in response happens earlier. So patients are very receptive to treatment if you get them within the first few weeks of becoming psychotic. Um, they respond extremely well. Um, and there are some diminishing returns after that, but, but only up to about a year. And after that, then uh, these more intensive programs probably work less well. It's not that they don't work at all, but that, that the patients are um, more difficult to help because there's been a lot more psychosocial damage in their lives by then. Work from Canada and um, ongoing work from Canada and Denmark testing these ideas in a, in a randomized way um, suggests so far that five years of treatment is, is, is um, able to maintain the benefits of, the, of these uh, intensive programs better than two years. So at least for a subgroup, they're going to need um, this type of care for, for a bit longer at least. And obviously some patients might, might need more intensive treatment for a very long time, but that is very much the minority actually. So I won't go through this as a summary of, of all the progress in first episode psychosis. The outcomes are actually better for schizophrenia and psychosis than people think, like, except for functional outcomes. The symptomatic out outcomes tend to improve over time. Functional outcomes are poor unless functional outcomes are supported with practical programs for vocational recovery and looking after patients in much more holistic, intensive ways. Physical health is, a, is an emerging problem. It's, it's, a, it's a big killer for these patients as, alongside suicide, and um, it's a preventive opportunity to actually um, help these patients have healthy lives and avoid um, cardiovascular disease and other, other risks that they might be exposed to. This is a major priority. So if we learn some lessons from cancer here, we try to, in cancer, prevalence is actually increasing due to, to increasing life expectancy, but the success of treatment is, 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 is improving too. And that's because they, they do prevention where they can. They certainly prioritize early diagnosis and uh, they get it right in terms of, you know, uh, most of the time between the balances of, uh, of risks and benefits. And they don't keep the patients out of care once they've been patched up after an acute episode, uh, after an initial episode of care. They sustain treatment and they follow up patients and they give them treatment in, as intensively as they need it for as long as they need it. And, and that, that is something we do not do in mental health care anywhere in the world that I've seen. And of course, you know, they have got some breakthrough medications and they're personalizing medicine, uh, uh, cancer medicine where they can. And these are important, you know, future benefits and they're already having an effect, but they're not the reasons for the downturn, uh, for the improvement in, in, uh, in outcomes in cancer. The, the, the three strategies I mentioned earlier, prevention, early diagnosis, and sustained treatment have been the major contributors so far, in my opinion. Now, just the last part of the talk um, is focusing on extending early intervention, as I mentioned before, beyond psychosis into new uh, territory, new models of care are acquired, new cultures of care. 
Um, we started this journal 10 years ago to try to promote this idea across the, the, the diagnostic spectrum. And <clears throat> one of the key facts we have to understand is that mental illnesses are the chronic diseases of the young, or potentially chronic. We look at the incidence curve of burden of disease across the lifespan. It's quite different in, in mental illness from what it is in physical illness. Physical illness, the main burdens occur over 50. There's, there's a cluster of burden in the prepubertal child, as you can see too. But between puberty and middle age, but especially between puberty and the mid-20s, um, young people are actually very physically healthy these days in, in developed countries. The main scourges of the past, like the infectious diseases like TB, tuberculosis, um, are not anywhere near as common. And the main health problems are actually mental ill health and substance use disorders, um, which surge through adolescence, peaking in the early 20s, and desisting or dropping off after the mid-20s. So this suggests that we should have a very strong system of care that's very good at engaging young people across the period of transition to adult life from puberty through to the mid-20s, which um, is pretty much when people become mature adults these days. It's, even though legally the age is 18 and educationally the change is 18, um, young people are not mature adults until, uh, you know, certainly their brains are not mature uh, and, and, uh, and, and they stop changing until the mid, the mid to late 20s. So and socially and economically, all of those things are in flux until around that time. And that is reflected also in this onset pattern of illness. So we need a very deep understanding of this transitional process of becoming a young, and um, we need to be much more responsive. Because the rates of care, uh, rates of need for care are very high. You know, 60%, I think, is the figure in this US study. Um, we've got similar figures in the Southern Hemisphere. 50-60% of um, young people have a need for care during this transitional period at some point. That doesn't mean they all need long-term intensive psychiatric treatment, but probably more than half of them do need fairly expert care. But, um, but the other half, they will be relatively transient and self-limited, but they still have got a right to access help because things can go wrong. Currently in Australia, um, I'll be going back to 2008 at least, only 13% of young men with a diagnosable mental disorder and 31% of young women were able to access any type of professional mental health care, let alone evidence-based care. So very minimal level of access to judicial care, and we had not built this the middle span of, of our health system for young people. There was a completely missing element from probably late adolescence in particular through to the mid-20s, when there was a great need for it, especially in terms of early intervention and intensive care, and very little provision. The models of care were orientated towards younger kids, and middle-aged adults with chronic illnesses, and everybody else tends to miss out. We have embarked on, on a major reform process in Australia since those figures were collected um, over the last 10 years, and this is um, described in detail in a paper in Lancet Psychiatry in 2014, December 2014. Um, it's, a, it's something that's been happening in other countries too, um, in partnership with us. But um, the main vehicle so far has been Headspace, which is a, an enhanced primary care service for young people aged 12 to 25. It focuses on mental health, alcohol and other drugs, physical health, vocational assistance, and um, I suppose uh, family support, youth participation are other key ingredients as well, all in a one-stop shop. So youth cafe sort of environment, um, Youth-friendly general practitioners, uh, health staff, youth workers, vocational, drug and alcohol, and maybe a bit of special psychiatry input where possible too. Enhanced primary care, but still quite specialised, but you know, front line. You can walk in, you can ring up, you can access it online to eHeadspace, and um, it's transformed access from the system on the left, clunky, old-fashioned, good at keeping people out, to a system on the right which is engaging, attractive, got some key components that are essential, um, the one-stop shop idea that uh, the iPhone personifies, and the atmosphere, the, the affection that people feel for their iPhones, the relationship they have with them, that's what we want to try and create in our mental health environments, our cultures of care. 
welcoming, engaging, uh, and user-friendly. There will be a hundred of these centres around Australia this year, uh, currently 94 in operation. That's about 50% of population coverage. So we're halfway there with our primary care model. And I haven't got time to go into it today, but we've uh, a number of papers published uh, with large data sets from, from this, um, this reform. Um, the sort of problem is patients presented, but they're not required to tick up all the boxes on a DSM uh, score sheet or, or manual page. They can present with problems, yeah, um, um, which might be uh, bullying or the effects of bullying, uh, anxiety, stress, exam stress, relationship problems, um, and so on. And often these things are uh, surface manifestations of something deeper going on. Um, or their causes and, and uh, concomitants of these, uh, of what we call mental disorders. And there's often physical issues to be dealt with too, alcohol and other drugs or self-medication very commonly, and particularly practical problems with educational pathways and with, with vocational and work and, and with family relationships. And obviously families are very important to be supporting and involving right up to the age of 25, not just stopping at 18 as, as so often happens to very poor effect. The stage of illness, uh, we are tapping into early stages of illness as, as we were hoping. Uh, so it's a great research platform too, as I'll come back to in a minute. The outcomes are better in terms of distress and functioning, yeah, even in a short period of time. And we do need a backup specialist system to support this, but that is something that's much more difficult to construct and resource, and we haven't made as much progress with that. So we need a lot more other sources of expertise and, um, to back in this sort of frontline sort of service. Youth mental health is, is a, a key reform front. Um, it, it's going to be a huge infrastructure for learning about um, how these illnesses develop and how to treat them better, developing and testing new treatments. But as a sort of social movement, we've involved young people very strongly in this and we set up the National Youth Mental Health Association. Young people, together with ourselves, have produced this national declaration of youth mental health with key targets, about suicide and employment and a whole range of other practical outcomes as well. We've had three international conferences, all huge successes, with about a third of the audience being young people themselves, so 200 out of 600 in Montreal were young people with and without mental illness. Um, and researchers and clinicians and policy makers and so on, all coming together and um, we're going to learn a lot more and we're going to hopefully transform things. And biological research, psychosocial research, epidemiological research, they're all key um, contributors and pillars to actually make this actually work on a scientific and evidence-based uh, platform. So these are powerful ideas. They're ideas hopefully whose time has come. And this is the, uh, the founder of the Royal Flying Doctor Service in Australia, John Flynn. Um, it's still going strong after uh, nearly 100 years. And he said if you start an idea, nothing would stop it. Well, that's not necessarily true because ideas have to be stage managed and, and, and uh, implemented and translated into reality with lots of good ideas that haven't been. So the whole series of steps, um, the innovation cycle, uh, is probably a good way of thinking about it. Um, and, but it's not actually rocket science. That's the other thing that this slide is trying to say. This is, this is, a lot of this is common sense. The rocket science comes in uh, on the research side where the complexity of the brain, the complexity of human life have to be studied and understood in ways that will help us to, to deliver our mission. But um, the, the essential vision and mission is something that everyone can share, everyone can relate to, and everyone as a, as, a, as, a, as a human being who's been young and been through this period of life and struggled. Um, but family members in particular who are worried about their uh, teenage or young adult kids, and the society as a whole, because because the economic and productivity aspects and, uh, of society are very dependent on on all of these young people, uh, as many as possible, reaching their potential and not ending up on welfare payments or the economic scrap heap. Um, so these are major social as well and economic issues as well as. Um, psychological and biological. And uh, so I hope um, in terms of transforming things into the future, 
we all be able to play our role, but we do need frameworks and paradigms to actually work within. That's why I've tried to share some of the thinking that we've had about those issues with you today. So in closing, I'd just like to acknowledge um, all my amazing colleagues in Australia um, um, who've worked for a long period together collaboratively around this, particularly um, all the people in the top half of the slide. And of course, people in many other countries as well, particularly in early psychosis, but more, more recently in youth mental health and early intervention in other fields. And all the funders and, and sources of support we've received as well over the years, uh, some of which are listed there too. So thank you very much for listening. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through September 2016. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through September 2016. You'll receive an email from LabGroups alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.